looking forward to uh, what the Lord has with us in our worship time together. And I'm just asking God to either give us a riot or revival. Amen. And hopefully it's the latter, the revival portion. But uh, I'm glad to see you here today. Uh, some of y'all not afraid of a little cold air coming down. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but, you know, all this Yankee dust keeps blowing from the north is filling my head, and I got this ringing in my ears, and, and it is, it's that north wind blows it down, you know, it just, you know, needs to get a good south wind and blow it right back up where it came from. Be just all right with me. So praise the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, don't be dead. It's rule number one. Let's, let's stick to it this morning. I'd like to talk to you about crisis at the cross, sir. Just say, what do you mean? Well, one, it kind of follows through with what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, but more importantly, I think today's message is a message for not only our church and for us as individuals. I really believe this is a nation for the church in general, especially in the Western Hemisphere where things have turned more into just kind of playing at church instead of really being at church. I, I really feel we've come to the place in church today in the Western Hemisphere at least where it's like where Jesus talked to the Pharisees that you're like children playing in the marketplace. You know, if somebody didn't play your favorite song, then you just go find somebody else that'll toot the flute the way you want it. Now, unfortunately, we've come to that place in our culture and in our world as well. But I want to talk to you what I believe is, is, is a very important strategic place that we are right now, I believe, as a nation, and how we need to make right choices. Your life is made up of millions of choices every day. And I think most of us are aware that if we make a good choice, it leads to a good place. You make a bad choice, it takes you where you really don't want to be. But all too often, people don't look down the road to see where their choices are going to lead them. It says about Moses in chapter 11, you know, that he saw the suffering of the children of Israel and he saw the pleasures of sin for a season. And instead of choosing palace pleasure, he chose the suffering of the people of God over and against that. Kind of ridiculous decision when you look at the world we live in today. Anybody that's in the, in the world would look at that and say, oh, but, but that's an idiotic decision. You can have the palace life, the palace pleasures, the palace, you know, all that. It's the, the lap of luxury. What's the matter with you? Why would you choose that? He said he had respect and to the reward. What's that mean? He looked down the road and saw where each choice would lead him and how that would help us immensely in our lives if we really just take the time to be more discerning in the choices that we make. I'm going to be speaking today out of Exodus chapter 32. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to open up to that, and we'll have it on the screen as well. But in Exodus chapter 32, it's the story of the children of Israel as they are out of Egypt, but not yet into the promised land. And this is where we kind of left off last week. We talked about, you know, the, the troubles and how that we need to be not, not like the whiners and the murmurs of Egypt. We need to be realizing that how to win is through Christ and be what God's called us to be. We talked about all those issues that they faced. As Paul wrote, the church should ex look at those things in the past and see them as examples of things that we should do and not do. So as we move to this whole story, I want to just stay here one more week and camp around this whole passage of Scripture in the camp with the children of Israel. And the story takes up here where Moses has gone up on the mountain to receive the commandments of God, where God himself is with his finger penciling out the, the law, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. But while he's gone, meanwhile back at the ranch, things have gone awry, things are in bad shape, things do not look good. And so, as he's up there seeking God's face and God's preparing Moses for the leadership role that he has in the wilderness, God says, uh, Moses, you know, to realize down below things have gone awry and I'm going to deal with those people and I'm going to get rid of them. Well, this is where this, the, the passage takes up. Moses has come down after interceding on behalf of the people that God would not get rid of them, but he would spare them because they are his people and he has made the covenant with them. And he's, he's basically operating in a role of intercession and then he comes down and he picks up the story there where he stands in the, the gate of the camp. And it talks about, if you read the passage, now when Moses saw that the people were out of control for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among the enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord come to me and all the sons of Levi gathered together unto him. And he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, every man, now this is a little strange if you don't read the whole story, Put a sword upon your thigh and go back and forth out gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. Those are the people who chose not to respond to the invitation call that, that he had given to the nation of Israel, who weren't going to be for the Lord. And so then it says, so when the sons Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men fell that day. Then Moses said, dedicate yourself today to the Lord and every man 
and, and to, for every man has been against his son and against his brother in order that he may stow, bestow a blessing upon you. Now, let's back up a few verses to where he talks about, you know, this is, this is time to make a decision. Whoever is for the Lord said. In fact, Moses comes down to the camp quite angry and uh, so angry that he breaks the tablets that God has pinned out and he has to go back later and chisel them out himself. But he's so angry, he throws the tablets down and they are broken and he's calls on the people of God and exposes them in their sin and calls for those people to repent and get right. Said, you know, who's ever for the Lord's side, let him come. I don't know what the camp of Israel, I've heard anything from a million to three million to 10 million to hundreds of thousands, but all but 3,000 obviously have made a, a vocal, at least some kind of movement towards the right choice. Those who haven't now face judgment. By the way, it shouldn't be surprising to us anytime we make a bad choice, we're going to face judgment anyway. It may not happen today and it may not happen in the moment, but sooner or later, every bad choice leads to a bad place. It's a product and a byproduct of making a bad decision. If it's a decision against the Lord and the will, the will of God, then obviously there's always judgment that follows. You can't just kind of put God on hold and say, I'm going to make this choice, this choice, and this choice, and expect God to bless it just because you made the decision. And all too often, at least in our contemporary Christian culture, we have that kind of mindset. It's kind of pick and choose at God the way we want to pick and choose at God. Now, remember the children of Israel, they're down in the camp. Moses is gone. Aaron's left in charge. He makes a bad decision, all right? The people form, he forms this golden calf out of the golden earrings that were in the people's ears. We mentioned those earrings last week, that they were symbols of, of slavery and being bond slaves to the Egyptians. So now those earrings are taken out and melted down, and he forms this particular golden calf. As it happens, remember, back on the mountain, all back at the ranch, back on the mountain, you have Moses getting this word from God of what's going on. God said, these people are out of control. They've turned themselves over to idolatry. And Moses begins to intercede. Then he comes down to the camp and preaches very powerfully with a very obvious demonstration of the, of the zeal and the passion that he's experiencing in his life. Now, I'm sure there were people who were watching Moses at this point and say, can you believe that preacher? Look at him. Can you believe him? He look, he's just out of control. You know, and he's just rebuking and preaching. And, you know, we don't really want to hear that. In fact, that's probably why they elected Aaron, you know. Uh, Aaron, uh, praise God for Aaron. He's a, he was a great man of God, but like almost all people in scriptures, we see a point of failure in their life at some place or another, a place of brokenness, a place where they finally get to the end of themselves and get everything back right with God. Aaron hadn't reached this point right here and now. Aaron's making some bad decisions. But Moses comes down and he preaches this message, and it's a message of judgment, obviously. You know, it, he's, not, he's not, you know, being very palatable about the issue of immorality and idolatry that is taking place in the camp. Now, unfortunately, Aaron wasn't doing that, but Moses was. But th here's the deal. This same thing is happening in our world today, and it's happening in churches this morning. You're having prophets of God, preachers of God, who stand up, and they preach exactly what everybody wants them to, to hear. They preach a message that's sweet and humble and positive. And there's time for sweet message and positive message, but not when the house is burning. When the house is on fire, you're trying to get everybody awake and get out of the house before it destroys you. Amen? Now, I'm sure who, there are those who would mock this man of God, like many men of God in the past have been mocked, is preaching too hard, being way too serious. It's not comfortable. It's not exciting. It doesn't make me feel encouraged when you mention those kind of things. Let me tell you the difference between a, a true prophet of God and a false prophet of God. A true prophet of God is known just like Moses was known. He's on the mountain interceding, burdened, caring, compassionate, loving those people, praying for those people that they would not be destroyed. He comes down and he preaches the message of God without compromise, which is a hard message and a stern message that was needed in that moment. So he preaches wrath, but he always practices compassion. The false prophet, on the other hand, he'll do just the opposite. He's going to preach compassion. He's going to be everything you want to hear when you go to church, and you're going to feel all warm and fuzzy when you walk out. But he's going to practice wrath in his own life. He's there for himself, and the Bible talks about false prophets who are there just for what they can get off the flock and what they can fleece the flock for. 
How can I be blessed? How can I be prospered? It doesn't matter what happens to the people of God. I'm really only concerned about me. The Bible says it's just the, just the way it's going to be in the last days. In the end times, men shall heap to themselves, teachers having itching ears. What does that mean? It means they like to hear you say, that was wonderful. That was great. You're so wonderful. You're such a great communicator. You're such a great pastor. You're so, he's always fishing for the compliment. And he, he adjusts what he says to the congregation, not on the basis of need within the fellowship, but on the basis of what he can get back in something that strokes his own ego. There's a great difference between a false prophet and the true prophet of God. A true prophet of God will always preach the word of God, but he lives with a compassionate heart. Now, it says the people got out of control, and obviously, if you, if you this whole book of Exodus and the journeys, Go back to chapter 19 and chapter 20 where God has brought great deliverance and the people are having revival and the people are saying, the Lord, he is God. You know, we're going to be what God's called us to be. And it's, it's really, there's this time of recommitment and surrender as they walk out of Egypt, go through the Red Sea, God judges their enemies behind them, and it's celebration season. But not too long after this moment, we come to this moment. And no longer, I mean, you could, you could, you could treat, preach a message there called the tragedy of unkept resolutions, the tragedy of broken promises. Not that God breaks his promise, right? If anybody here can tell me a time when God broke a promise to you, it hadn't happened yet, and it never will happen. But how many of us could stand up today and say, here, I, yeah, I broke a promise to God. I made a commitment to the Lord, and I've gone back on my commitment, or I broke my, my vow, my promise to the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do you get to that place? I think it comes back to this crossroad. And I believe if we fail to choose correctly at these major crossroads of our life, we are certainly doomed for destruction. And the church has certainly got to come to the place where they will say, I would rather have truth and maybe suffer with the children of Israel as they did. I would rather have truth, be a person of integrity, be a man of character, a woman of integrity, than to compromise the convictions of God's Word and live in the pleasures of this world. And if we fail to choose, if we don't make that choice right, then we're always going to suffer for that choice. Well, they didn't make the choice right. They're worshiping this golden idol. There's all kinds of immorality. If you follow the storyline through, there's all on kind of godliness. It's party atmosphere. It's party central. You know, it looks like a butt. It's like a butt. It's far worse. But that's where the culture is, is it not? How do you get there? You, we, you've heard me talk about the domino principle before, right? So when, when the first domino falls and you line them all up, then the next domino and the next domino until they all collapse. What happened in the nation of Israel was this same kind of thing, the domino principle. And I think there's three major dominoes that fall in a culture, in a country, a nation, a church, or even a family. That when these three dominoes fall, it's just, it's, it's just destructive. And there's a lot of people today who are living kind of in that destructive lifestyle because they're failing in these three areas and they don't even realize it. It's kind of like Samson. Remember, he kept flirting with sin and flirting with sin and he said that when the Philistines finally came upon him, it says he rose at other times and shook himself and he didn't know that his strength was gone. I think that's where the church lies today in our country. That's why I think that's where Christians, many Christians fall into that category. They don't realize that the power of God has departed. They don't operate in the power of God. They've settled for some kind of self-made religion like the children of Israel. What's the first domino to fall? I think it's always this one. When leadership fails, that starts the whole process of failure. The greatest need, I think, in the church, the greatest need in our homes, the greatest need in this nation is for the leaders that God has ordained and appointed to rise up to be what God has called them to be. Because if you fail as a man, you fail in every area of your life. And people are living in this world, in this culture today, where they don't want to be what God's called them to be because they'd rather choose what the world has going on than to be what God has called us going on. I love what Tony Evans, when he called, I heard him preach a message one time called the feminization of the American male. It's a great sermon title, right? The message was even greater than the title. It was talking about how men, all this nation had abdicated, you know, leadership roles, you know, in, in, in the nation, in, in their homes, in the church. Let's let the women do it. Praise God that in Believer's Fellowship, we have a great majority of men. In fact, more than most that I've seen in most churches when you look at the percentages of men who've chosen to be godly men, of men who want to serve God. Amen? Now, there's still some of you guys who need to get on board. You say, how do you know? Because I know you, all right? I'm your pastor. 
The Bible says, any good shepherd will know the state of his flock. How do you know me? You peeking on me? No, I know the guy accused me this morning of reading his mail. No, I don't. The Holy Spirit is a tattletale. <laughs> Amen. He'll tell, he'll tell on me to Kathy at times. He'll tell on Kathy to me at times. He'll tell me about you. He might you tell you about me even. But the Holy Spirit has a way of communicating with us. And we need to respond to that. But to abdicate the leadership in their home even to that of the role of, well, let's let the wife decide. If we're going to go to church, well, that's the wife's decision. If we're going to raise the children and, and minister to the children, that's the wife's decision. Instead of just being men of God. Men of God don't play well in the world, all right? Men of God don't play along. They don't get along well with friends in the world, all right? Because they're so different and they're so unique. I was writing a song not too long ago called Man of God, and in the context of the man of God is, it, the, the, the theme of the song basically, he's strange, he's different. And I was kind of writing it in relationship to when I get around a lot of people, you know, especially a lot of friends in, in the larger group of my family. You know, there's, there's Uncle Joe or whatever Joe, he's the pastor, you know. He's the pastor, so we expect him to be a little different. If you're a child of God, you're supposed to all of us be different. Amen? We're all called to live on the same level. Now, obviously, you're going to have a leadership role. You better be serious about it. But, you know, he said, you know, he's not odd. He's a man of God. That was pretty much the gist of the song. That should be our life. We're going to be odd to the world. But it doesn't matter what the world thinks anyway. It only matters what God thinks. But where we are as a culture is that we've given up this right of leadership as men. It seems that men, you know, at a certain point, they just quit, you know, being what God called them to be, or they, they, they hit middle age, you know, and they got to unbutton their shirt down their belly button, get a big old gold, gold nugget of jewelry around themselves, and a big gold chain and a Mercedes that, that's a convertible. Amen. And drive up and down the road and think they still got it. You never had it, all right? Start with so Don't think you still got it. Because you don't know what it is. It is it. it. It's him. That's what you need. And a man without God in charge of his life is not much of a man. Do I need to say that again? It's the absolute truth. I'm not trying to make an enemy of you. I'm trying to show you where you can find life and grace and the friendship of Jesus Christ in your life. We need men, and we need men who will stand up and be men. We don't need to sit around and wait for the ladies to do something, sir. You need to be what God's called you to be. You don't need to sit and wait for your wife to say, can we pray? Can we do this? And I can't tell you how many times I've been in counseling situations where somebody, well, my, I've told my wife this, I've told my wife that. That's not the way it works. What are you going to do, sir? Where are you going to take the leadership in your life? So domino number one, principle number one, when leadership fails, then everything else begins to crumble as well. But what's the second domino? The second domino is that when leadership fails, you can be sure the next thing to fail is the moral standard. Moral standards begin to fail. There's no right and wrong it's just whatever makes me happy and whatever suits me and whatever pleases me and whatever feels good to me there's that passage in proverbs that says that where no vision is the people perish there's different translations of that verse in the new american standard it says that there's no vision the people are unrestrained the new contemporary version says the people you know are, are uncontrolled it is a hebrew word which can be written that way even one translation i think is just as accurate says the people are naked certainly right in this situation wasn't it when there's no leadership to provide vision, when there's no leadership to provide direction, when there's no leadership to inspire those who follow, then certainly the people are unrestrained, uncontrolled, exposed, and vulnerable to attacks is the whole idea. And this is exactly what's happened in the nation of Israel at this time. The children of Israel have capitulated to a leader who's not going to be much of a leader. He's not going to have convictions. He's not going to have standards. He calls for everybody to bring their golden earrings. He takes them. He smelts them down. And the Bible says he fashioned himself. He fashioned the golden calf. And all too often, that's exactly what is happening in homes and lives and churches. I can't tell you how many pastors that I've dealt with over the years who at one time, I believe, were, were vigilant, were passionate, were zealous about the things of God, who held themselves to a high standard of commitment to Jesus Christ. But how many of those have fallen by the way or fallen aside simply because they quit being a dedicated, uncompromising pastor and leader of the people of God and begin to give in to things in the world and things of the world. They began to preach messages, what they called grace. The grace allows you to go do whatever you want to do because you're saved and you're a child of God and you're going to go to heaven. And, you know, there's, nothing's unlawful for you anymore. That's the message of grace to them. But the Bible makes it very clear that's not the message of grace. That's an abuse of grace. That's a misuse of grace. That if we are under grace, the Bible says, well, Paul writes to the church, one thing that the grace of God teaches us, it teaches us to deny all ungodliness. 
So anything that's not like God, that's on the deny package, all right? That's a no. Anything that glorified God in your life, that's a yes. See how simple the decision is there? See, how, but somebody has to lead the way in that because most of us, all of us, we're not geared to that naturally and normally. Our flesh doesn't want what God wants. Our flesh wants what we want. Once we're saved and in Christ now, we have been changed and we have the power in Christ Jesus to make the choice and to succeed in making that choice to do what God wants. But all too often, we don't take the long look. We're just looking and focusing on what feels good, what's right now, what do I need, what, how can I escape? And, and, and it becomes the focus of our life. Next time you come to a decision like that, remember what God says. There's no temptation taking you, which is common to man. Everybody deals with temptation. But God will, with every temptation, make a way of escape. We don't realize that because we don't think about that, because we don't recall that. We don't take a long look in the midst of our choices and temptations. We take the short look. What's easy? What's right now? What brings satisfaction? What do I like? What helps me? And your decision, folks, is a bad decision because you're just looking here. You know in your mind what God said. You know in your mind what God said do or don't do. It's all there, but it didn't get processed. And you have to come in the times of choice and the times of decision to make the long look, to take the long look and say, hey, God said this, so that overrules this. I think I'll just go with God. You say, it's just too easy. Praise God. You're the one who's making it difficult. I'm the one who tries to make it difficult. It's not. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Will I choose to believe God or not? Aaron, he fashions this golden calf. Aaron gives up. He wants to hear what the people say. He likes to hear what's going on. And now the people enter in first into idolatry, and the next thing is everybody begins to take their clothes off. Looks like the culture we live in now. I told you I was walking to the mall not too long ago with my wife, and the sign said, ladies' dresses half off. And I turned and said, there are more off than that. You know? A <laughs> whole lot more off than that. But, I mean, think about where we come. Some of you are like old like me. Can you imagine... 15 years ago, a victorious secret commercial on primetime family TV time? Never. Would never happen. 10 years before that, would never happen. I mean, you even had the Van Dykes on that TV show sleeping in different beds on TV. Because there would be no, no thing that, no, that was being broadcast that would be allowed. You know, it, it's like the rating system. Have you ever noticed movie rating systems? You know, what used to be a PG movie, you know, would be a G movie now. You know, what used to be, what is a PG-13, you know, that's an R now, but they, they call it PG-13. It's how many words and how much violence, all those things have to do with the rating. But listen, you don't go by the world's rating system because it's always changing. You go by the standard of God. You know, how's it always changing? I remember in the 70s, the biggest thing that we were dealing with as church was uh, we had so many young people get involved in, you know, more relationships and fornication and premarital sexual relationships. I even wrote a book back in the 80s talking about how to deal with love, lust, and romance and what, how, how to make the right choices in your life. That's the book's kind of off the shelf. That's not relevant anymore. What's relevant? Well, we, listen, we've gone so far from adultery and premarital sex. Now we're, it goes to homosexuality. Now then it moves to being this transgender thing and gender. You know, we, we're so confused. We got people who don't even know what they are anymore. And the reason we don't know what we are anymore is because we as the church have failed to present the truth of the Word of God. The truth of the Word of God makes it clear that a man is a man, a woman is a woman. And the, and the Word of God is clear that God made you the way He made you, and we all have temptations. So if you feel led as a man to have a relationship with another man, that's just sin. It doesn't mean that, you're, you know, that, that that's what you ought to go do because you're tempted that way. I may be tempted to slap you in the face. All right? But I don't slap you in the face just because I'm tempted to. And I hope you don't slap me in the face. You know, I could say, well, I slap. Why'd you slap me in the face? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a face slapper. <laughs> what do you mean you're a face? Well, I was born this way. I've wanted to slap faces ever since they slapped my bottom. <laughs> That's what I am, you know? So I'm going to start a face slapper's movement. You know, and I want to get me a, an emblem. I think I may just take the rainbow and turn it upside down. Call that the face slapper's emblem. Um, you, see, you see the ridiculousness of how we justify our sin, but how does it go? It keeps getting worse and worse and worse 
and worse. And now we're at that, that place in Romans chapter 1 where God said, this is where it goes. If you keep rejecting me and you keep rejecting my word and you keep rejecting the truth of the word of God, this is where you're going to end up. And you'll give yourself over to every vile affection and every ungodly affection that you'll be desiring men desiring men, women desiring women, and on and on it goes to pedophilia and every ungodly perverse thing that men can think of. But let me understand, all right, and help you understand that all that's just as bad as the first of it. Premarital sex. That's not a big deal in the culture anymore, all right? People have premarital sex on all the TV shows now. And when you sit there and watch it, it's a great show. That's so funny. You know, I watched about five seconds of that Roseanne show the other day. And I didn't even watch the show. I watched the commercial. And just the things that came off the commercial about the little boy who wasn't quite sure what he was, and he's standing on a step, and he doesn't have underpants on. And they're making a joke about that. We just have a sick culture. But yet in the sickness of our culture, we not only take it in, we're entertained by it. You see where we've come? And we have to somewhere kind of take ourselves back and say, I'm not going to be entertained by that anymore. That's offensive. And why is it offensive? Because God said it was offensive. So whether it's this end of it or that end of it, it's still all offensive to God. You say, well, you're just, that's just hate speech. Yeah, I know, I hate the face slappers. <laughs> when did it ever become hate speech to tell you, thus saith the Lord? This is what God says. This is what God, this is what God desires. This is God's will. But I can guarantee you, the more and the more and the more this culture gets sick of Christianity, the more you're going to be characterized as the hate speech person. We practice compassion. We preach the truth, but we love all folks. I love that guy who's the pedophile as much as I love that person who's the homosexual, as much as I love that person who's the adulterer, as much as I love that person who's involved in premarital sex, as much as I love you. Jesus died for all men, and sin is sinner's eyes, and we've got to get back to the church and say, hey, I've been sucked into this vacuum, and I'm not going there anymore. I'm not going to be entertained by it. I'm not going to laugh at it. I'm going to be what God's called me to be. I'm going to stand up for Jesus and be the man, the woman you're supposed to be. What's happened? The moral standard fails, and again, it's like the dominoes, and they begin to fall and fall. And what happens? We're unrestrained, and we're uncovered, and we're completely exposed. What happens next? Domino number three, the whole religious system fails. Now, last week, remember I said in our message that we were talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness, that I said that we are real, not religious, and there is a difference. But once we do become real, you know what happens? We get religious. We're religious about our Bible. We're religious about God. We're religious about loving people. We're religious about prayer. And James said there is an undefiled religion. How does it get undefiled? Because religion is really just trying to please God. It gets undefiled when you realize the only way you can please God is Jesus. You've got to have Christ in your life. You give your heart and your life completely to Jesus. And tell you, that, is a, that is a relief if you've never experienced it. Because that means that no longer are you trying to prove yourself to God. That is a waste of time. You say, well, I don't know. I'm pretty worthy. You don't realize how unworthy you are. The Bible says you're depraved, you're lost, you're dead, and you're, you're in sin, and you're offensive to God without Jesus Christ. But God loved you in that ugly state you were in and came and sent his son Jesus to die for you and to give his life for you, and now you can become a new creation. But now, because I love him, I want to serve him. Because I love him, I want to be what he wants me to be. Because I love him, I'm going to follow him. Because I love him, I'm going to trust his word. Because I love him, I'm going to share Christ. Because I love him, I'm going to come to church. Because I love him, I'm going to give. Amen? That's, that's, that's undefiled religion. I'm going to take care of the widow. I'm going to help the homeless. I'm going to minister to people. I'm going to care about people. That's undefiled religion. But what happens with these people? What are they doing? They're worshiping a golden calf idolatry. In fact, it doesn't have to be a golden calf. I think it was Billy Graham, as I've stated before, who said, we don't worship golden images anymore before us. We have our own little golden calves in our mind. We have a religious system of our own making and our own thinking of this is the way I please God. It's like Oprah's response when somebody asks her about Jesus and Christianity. She says, well, what I've done, I have my own kind of ideas, and I've formulated a little bit from everything and put it together to my, I guess, the O religion, you know? Well, I'm sorry, the old religion won't get you very far. You need the Jesus Christ commitment to Christ in your life. 
Now, folks, I want you to know I've shared some things this morning that are reality because I think every once in a while we need to have a reality check. All right? We need a reality check. And we need to get real serious about where we are and see if our religion's corrupted. I tell you, you can check yourself. Is my religion corrupted? Have I gone to what it talked about in, last week? I just become a murmur. And God said, you're murmuring against me. I become ungrateful. And my spirit is, is a spirit of ingratitude towards others. I want everybody to recognize me. I want everybody to honor me. I want everybody to bless me. It's no longer about God. It's about me now. That's when religion becomes defiled. It becomes a place where I, I, I can do my thing externally and do whatever I want internally. I mean, it's one thing to sit here and, 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 and talk about the, the incestuous relationships of the culture, the pedophilia and the homosexuality and the adultery and the premarital sex and all those things. You know, and everybody says, hey, man, but what about the pornography? What about those little visits to those little pornographic pages? Those things that defile you much deeper than you'll ever realize. The things that leave such a lasting imprint upon your psyche that are so cancerous to every relationship you will ever experience in your life. What about those things? Just religion gets defiled. And it doesn't have to be these external demonstrations. You can sit here in church. You can preach this message. You can be in the ensemble. You can be a lift group leader. You can be somebody who stands at the door every Sunday and greets every person who comes to that door, and your heart still be defiled. Because we know how to have a religious appearance to people. But God sees well beyond and well below that surface that we would put up for him. And this, it's the hypocrisy of our lives that's so, so damning to us that we don't really see what God's up to. Religion is defiled. And this is where they are. They're worshiping the golden calf. There's all kinds of immorality. I could probably spend another hour and a half just talking about the moral decay that our culture is experiencing, that America is experiencing. But I want to say this. I believe the majority comes back to our responsibility to be the bearers of a standard, that we hold the moral standard high that we cry out against the culture when it's wrong, that we stand up, and it's not just to say this is wrong, we're pointing people to what is right. And what is right is you coming to Christ, you getting your heart right with God, you serving Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, and being serious about it, not being a pretend disciple, not being some kind of fan as we've talked about before, but really being a genuine follower of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Out in the marketplace, in your home, in your relationships, you can tell how godly you really are if you'll step back and just take a look in the spiritual mirror for a moment. And that spiritual mirror is the Word of God. That's why we preach the Word. It's what helps us. It's what transforms our life. It's what empowers our life. It's why we need truth. I understand why it's quiet this morning. But I think the same thing that needs to we need to realize is just as it was in Moses' day, so it is today. And somebody needs to stand in the gate of the camp and say, who is on the Lord's side. Who's going to follow Jesus? Not your made-up Jesus. Not the Jesus of your own mental making. Not the one that satisfies you, but the one that you're interested in satisfying. The one that you're not trying to get something from, a ticket to heaven, get out of hell, get a blessing for your life, find healing for your body. But the Jesus who calls you to deep relationship, genuine fellowship, and a genuine love relationship. Now listen carefully. It's a valley of decision. It's the crisis at the crossroads. Choose correctly, enjoy the blessings of God on your life. Choose incorrectly, and you mess your life up. The Bible says, and Jesus said, you know, there's just two roads. How many? Now, what he didn't say, Jesus didn't say, well, there's two roads. There's a broad road and a narrow road. Oh, by the way, there is a fence in the middle. I don't know how many people told me, so I'm not really in around. I'm kind of on the fence. There is no fence. All right? It's not there. It's a fabrication of your mind. Truth dictates you're on the broad road. You may be hanging toward the edge, trying to walk that little white line on the side, but you're on the wrong road. It's going to take you to the wrong place. It's a bad decision. It's, you're not going to end up where you really want to be in your life. Your brother Joe, that's, that's so, that's, that's difficult, that's hard preaching. That's not hard preaching, that's Jesus preaching. It was Jesus who said that. And when you start questioning the letters in red, you really got some major problems, amen? Listen, you know what else he said? 
that in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. But what do we find many people in our churches doing? Trying to serve two masters. They would never identify the other master as who it really is, which we know who that is. It's either Jesus or the devil, right? They just thought, it's me. It's, just, it's what I want. It's my will. It's my way. But what's happening, you're just becoming a pawn in the hands of somebody who's manipulating you. And you're being spiritually manipulated. In fact, he's so good at what he does, the Bible says you can be blinded by it, this deception. And so there's these two roads, and Jesus said, so here you are. It's a broad road or a narrow road. And he went on to say, you can't serve two masters. You're going to hate one and despise the other, or you'll hold one, hold to one, and despise the other. You say, well, Brother Joe, I'm not really being what God's called me to be, but I really can't say I'm despising the Lord. Every day, more and more. When you find yourself walking out, well, that term was used too hard. You're despising the Lord. If it was truth, it was the Word of God, it was preached with compassion. You walk out of here. I don't like that. You're despising the Lord. It's not me you're despising. It don't bother me. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. All right? I'll spend some more time in prayer for you. But I'm on the right road. When you get out there and you start weighing yourself out and you start looking, making decisions, like, well, look at so-and-so, and they claim to be a Christian, and, and they go do this, and so I'm going to go do this. Why, why can't I go do that? You're despising the Lord. You're measuring yourself. Jesus even said, if you measure yourself by other men, you become foolish. Well, you know, I, I think I'm going to join that church. I, I remember as a kid, that's what I told my mom. I said, I want to be a Methodist. <laughs> Nothing against Methodists if you're looking by Facebook. Wesley's were some of the greatest preachers America ever saw. But I want to go to the Methodist church because they got to dance. And I like to dance. I still do. Ask Kathy. I'm dancing around the house all the time. She just sits there and shakes her head. That's not dancing. That's not dancing. <laughs> Commercials come on with some pumped up music. I'm dancing. You know? So I wanted to go to the Methodist church so I could be a dancer, go dance, you know, go to dances, school dances and stuff, because my mom was used to straight line hardcore Baptist and we weren't going to dance. But that's the way people do in their life today, isn't it? I think I'll join something else. Because I don't want truth. I will never, ever apologize for preaching you the truth. I love you. I trust God's going to take the truth, use it in your heart, use it in your life, and you're going to celebrate a victory in your life, your home, your heart, your marriage. Because the truth, it sets us free still. I know some of you are wishing I'd be quiet, so let me just rush along here. He stands in the gate of the camp and says, who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Now, again, remember I said the tragedy of this in Exodus 19, several chapters before this, he said, we're going to obey God no matter what he says do. Haven't we had, many of us have had that moment, right? I'm going to obey God. But then comes the trials and tests of life. And then we start failing. We start slipping. And, it, and it's not like we have this big blowout, you know, boom, everything explodes. You know, it's, it's like a slow leak, you know? And just a little bit less. So y'all had that in your car, right? We have that slow leak, and you keep putting off getting it changed or getting it fixed. You go, you go in every once in a while, you just put a little more air in it. And some of y'all come in on Sunday and try to put a little more air in it, but you're still leaking. And sooner or later, in the right time, right situation, right speed, right heat, right heat, that's going to blow up. You know? And we just, we just kind of milk along until what we need to come back to is come back to the resolution and the covenant and the oath and the pledge that we made when we said, All to Jesus I surrender. And get back to that place in our life where we really do surrender all to Jesus. Where it's not just a words of a song or, or something we say because we know it's the right thing to say. Francis Schaeffer, one of the greatest minds in the last century, Christian, he made this statement. He said about, the, about what he saw the church doing and, and how they were living, and w living in the culture at the time. He stated that the greatest crisis facing us is spiritual, first of all. And for Christians, the greatest crisis you face is really a spiritual crisis. He says, we've been too satisfied to just be religious than to really be spiritual. Just kind of check the list off. In other words, I prayed, I read my Bible, went to church. But when it comes to practical aspects of really living for God and really being committed, a disciple of Jesus Christ, we're really walking in relationship and fellowship with him. It's another deal. He called that terminology, he had a terminology, he called it false pietism. False pietism is when we come to church a few hours a week, but the other 166 hours of our life really aren't under the dictates of the Holy Spirit in our life. They're under what we want to do and what we think is right or wrong. 
false pietism and we can kind of go to church a couple hours a week and what we expect to happen in the spiritual realm within the church is for other people to be spiritual, for other people to pray, for other people to study, for other people to prepare, for other people to teach, for other people to lead, for other people to serve. Just serve me. I don't want to help out. I don't want to be involved, but you know, be sure and take care of me, my needs, my wants, my family, my kids. It's false pietism. We're a part of a body. We're all called to serve in the body of Christ. Now, I know when it comes to this issue, every one of us in a sermon like this, because I've been there, and when I study for this sermon, I start looking for excuses too. You have to realize, I've been preparing for this all week. In fact, I preached it last Sunday night in Conroe at a church. So I've been under conviction for months. <laughs> Just letting God dig deeper and plow deeper and work deeper in my heart and in my life to take me to where he wants me to be. And just to let him move in our hearts and life, that's the call to say, yes, I am on the Lord's side. Other than the other way, which is to find excuses. You know, it's the old thing, excuses like armpits. You, you got two of them and they both stink. It's the same thing in the, our Christian life. They stink before the Lord's nostrils. Well, you know, I can. It won't work. You remember what Aaron said? Did you read the story? When Aaron is approached by Moses and Moses is in a very strong leadership role, he said, he said Aaron, what have you done? I didn't do nothing, is the response. I asked the people to bring me their gold earrings, and they brought them to me, and I put them in that hot pot, and out jumped this calf. That's what he said. That sounds like some of our I don't know. It just happened. It never just happens. How many people sat in my office to be counseled about something and they've had a crisis in their life and they said, well, how'd you get to this point? Because, folks, if you don't know how you got to that point, you're going to be back there soon again. You're gonna, it will be repeated in time. How'd you get here? It just happened. It's like the girl who comes in, you know, and tells her mama, I'm pregnant. He got me pregnant. Excuse me. The old two to tango thing, you know. We just want to blame somebody else. Y'all remember the Twinkie defense in that court case back in 97, for those of you who are old enough to remember that? That was Moscone, the, the California mayor, and the other gay activists were murdered by this one guy. And the story was with this, this guy who murdered them was his lawyer presented what they called the Twinkie defense. And the Twinkie defense was that this guy was very physically fit and had really held to a strict diet, and he really came to a disappointing time in his life and started, he started binging on sweet stuff, ho-hos and Twinkies and donuts, all right? And so it led to his insanity. That's stupid. And some of, you, some of you have your own Twinkie defense. Let me give you a Twinkie defense. Pastor Joe, I really would. You don't realize that's my, my husband. I can't beat my it's my wife. It's my kid, my boss. I could really, it wasn't for my boss. It's, it's, I don't need money. If I had more money, it wouldn't be this way. If I lived in that neighborhood, it'd be a whole other, I'd live for Jesus better. Twinkies. Remember the, the affluenza case recently? Guy just, kid just got out of jail. He's now an adult. Remember the judgment before? He gets drunk as a teenager and kills four people, a family, in an accident. It was horrific, all right? It was a horrible thing that happened. And the lawyer comes to argue the case, and he uses this idea that, well, the kid was spoiled. He had rich parents. There was no real discipline. He just got to do whatever he wanted to do. And so there he is. He gets drunk and kills people. So it's not his fault. It's his mother and his, mo his father's fault. It's money's fault, really. It's a ridiculous excuse. Leadership fails share this final story with you about a car accident happens on the highway four people are unconscious drug out of the car by the cops cops start looking around to find somebody to explain it was just a single car accident they look back in the car and there's a monkey in there they ask the monkey what happened so they said nobody else to question let's question the monkey the monkey said the monkey couldn't talk y'all do know that right but he could gesture he said what was the man doing the monkey said He's drinking. Well, what was the wife doing? She was nagging. Kids in the back seat, what were they doing? They were fighting. Well, that explains it. 
Because I will let go in the car. Who's not going to have an accident? Cops were walking away to file a report. One turns back and says, just a minute. Goes back and asks the monkey, what were you doing? <laughs> we got too many monkeys driving the car. We got too many monkeys driving the church. We got too many monkeys driving committees. Guys that aren't committed. People that aren't surrendered. People that are full of bitterness, people filled with strife, people filled with their opinions. We just need to get back to loving Jesus and committing our heart, our life, our families, our church back to Jesus Christ as the Lord of all that's in our life. Can I get an amen? amen. Anything else is a cop-out. Anything else is an excuse. Anything else is not going to work. That day when Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? You know, he gave an invitation. We don't even have churches that don't even give invitations anymore. He gave an invitation. Why? Because we don't want to put people on the spot. We'll tell that to Jesus because everywhere he went, he divided them or decided them. Everywhere he went, he said, come unto me. Everywhere he said, if any man will come at me, let him deny himself, take up the cross, follow me. Over and over again, throughout the Bible, from Genesis to the book of Revelation. In Genesis, Adam, where are you? Come out of there. Come forward. To the book of Revelation, if you have ears to hear, it's time to hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. Now, I'm sure there were people, that 3,000 that died that day, who when the guys came with the sword said, hey, 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 hold on. Don't use that on me. I've changed my mind. What makes us think we get another opportunity? Sir, what makes you think you're ever going to have another chance to hear another sermon? Ma'am, what, what makes you think at all? that you have as much time as you want to make any decision you decide to make and desire to make. When you get ready, you'll do it on your time. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Word of God says, today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Because when you harden your heart, you won't hear it next time. And you keep saying no to God and no to Jesus and no to the Holy Spirit, sooner or later, you're going to become what the Bible calls reprobate. You just get hard heart. It doesn't bother you anymore to be bothered by the Holy Spirit. You become unfunctional and unusable in the kingdom of God. Some of you here today, and you have been putting Jesus off as your Lord and Savior for a long time. You've tried to kind of bring Jesus into the framework of your life, but you really don't want him to be in charge. You want, you want to go to heaven, and you like the people that like Jesus, but yet when the time comes, the Holy Spirit comes and he starts speaking to you about your salvation and about giving your life and turning from yourself and turning from your sin, and you say, I just can't do that. Or you get to the point where you're ready to do it, but then comes that point where the Bible says we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth. You just can't do that because you're so concerned about what somebody's going to think or say or do if you give your life to Jesus. That's a sorry reason to die and go to hell. Is it not? Amen. What would hinder you today from giving your life to Christ when you have this clear call to a life that will be changed eternally by the power of God's Spirit and by the presence of God working in your life? You can be changed. For those of you here today that are Christians, you, you're so far away from God, you wouldn't recognize him if you ran into him in Walmart. Because your heart's become calloused. You're not really wanting to hear from God. You're not desiring his word. You don't spend any time with him. You just go along with this framework that you're right with God because you do certain things. That's not going to save you. And it, it's not going to help you in your Christian life if you are saved. You can do that as a Christian. The Apostle Peter said, you can wander so far away from God, you forget you, you forget you were saved. You become blinded. It's easy to get to that point. And instead of hearing a message like this, and saying, that's what the church needs. That's what our nation needs. That's what I need to hear today. You'd walk out of here and say, that's sorry, preacher. Miss the mark completely. The greatest need in our nation right now is for preaching like this and people like this who are speaking this message to our culture. Not in a spirit of anger, not in a spirit of, of, uh, of arrogance, but with genuine compassion. Saying God loves you and can change your life forever. And will forgive every sin you have ever committed in your life. And if I were to set you down with a pencil and a piece of paper, there's not enough paper for you to begin to write them out if we get honest with ourselves. God washes all that away. How do you get there? Moses stood in the gate and Sam said, Who, who's on the Lord's side? Who's going to make this decision? Who's going to follow? But you can't make any excuses. 
You can't make any excuses. What's the Lord saying to you today? Where's your spiritual walk right now? Where's your life? I've told you on many, many occasions that as opportunities avail, I will always be calling you deeper for Jesus, farther for Jesus, stronger for Jesus in your life. This is one of those days. But I think we have to pull back the cover on all our mediocrity. All our mediocrity. All of our carnality. And get serious about Christ in our life. Doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect. But it means I'm now empowered. And I'm moving towards perfection in Jesus. Would you stand with me with your heads bowed? And I would ask you just to bow your heads as you stand. I'm going to ask you this morning, just from my heart to your heart, for you to be as open to the Lord as possible and as honest with God as possible. How many this morning would just be willing to let God speak to your heart right now? No matter where you are in your walk with Christ, or even if you don't know Christ, I believe the Holy Spirit's presence here today is obvious. And I believe he wants to speak to you. All we have to do is open our heart and mind and ears and let him speak to us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me just ask you a question. How many in this room today know without any shadow of a doubt that you know that if you died today, you'd spend eternity with Jesus Christ because there was a time in your life when you gave your heart and faith to Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If that's you and you know that you know you're a believer, would you slip your hand up as a testimony? Just raise it up high as a testimony of the Lord. I know that I know I know I'm a child of God. Praise the Lord. You can put them down. You can put them down. How many of you that just raised your hand, you acknowledge the fact that you do know Jesus, could be honest enough to say, Pastor, God spoke to me today about some things in my life that I need to get right, that I need to settle, that I don't need to play around with, don't need to toy around with, don't need to be indefinite about. I need to be definite. You say, that's me, Pastor. Pray for me this morning. I'm talking to Christians. Pastor, that's me. There's things in my life I just need to get right with God today. I want to get up. Slip it up. Don't let Satan talk you out of this day. Just get it up high. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. Praise the Lord. You can put them down. We're going to pray together in just a moment. There's some of you here today who don't know for sure that if you die today that you would spend eternity with God, that you do know that you are a child of God. You've been religious, but you've never started that relationship with Jesus by surrendering your heart and following him in your life. It's not baptism. It's not the ordinances of the church that save us. It's Jesus that saves us and our faith in Christ that makes it real in our life. And how many could day to say, Pastor, I'm just not really sure that I've done that, or I know I've never really done that. If, if that's either one of you, just slip your hand up and say, because I want to pray for you. Pastor, that's me. I'm not sure that I really know Christ today as my Lord and Savior. Just slip your hand up and down. Praise the Lord of the others. Just slip it up and down. Any more? How many say, I'm just living with doubts. I'm just not sure. Put your hand up and down real quick. Let me pray for you too. All right, praise God. Praise God. And right there where you're standing, I want you just to kneel right now, and I want you to whisper this prayer out to our Heavenly Father. It's a prayer of commitment. No matter what the decision is, it's just sur it's a surrendering prayer. So I'm going to ask you in this moment that you just whisper this prayer to the Lord if you raise your hand for any of those things. Father, I have a need today, and I yield it to you. My heart has not been right, but I'm yielding it to you. You know where I failed you. And Lord, I want to confess it. I'd ask you to name it to him, whatever it's been. Just name it to him. I'm surrendering today, Lord Jesus. Tell him I'm surrendering. And I'm laying down my pride, my old life, and I'm choosing in this time of decision to say yes to you. I trust you today. And I thank you for speaking to me. With every head still bowed, if you prayed that prayer for anything, any one of those reasons we talked about, I want you to lift your head up one more time and look at me. If you prayed that prayer, just look right here. Just look right here if you prayed the prayer. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you ashamed of that? Are you ashamed of making a recommitment today or getting back on track with the Lord or giving your life to Jesus today. Because if you are, you're not, you're not going to go much further in this room. 
But if you're unashamed of that prayer and unashamed of that decision today, then I'm going to ask you to do something. Just what Moses said, all, he said, if you're on the Lord's side, come unto me. Now, in the context of this today, right here in this moment, if God has been speaking to you in this message, then I'm going to ask you to come to me because I want us together down here at the floor, and we're going to pray together as a group. It's a little different than the way we normally do this, but I want you to step out right now. Believers, unbelievers will come and make We're going to stand right here, and we're going to pray together in this moment. Just come and gather around, pull in tight. If you've never given your life to Christ today, come, please, with this group. There's no better time, no better place than right now. Move in a little bit as folks are coming. We fill this altar this morning for the glory of God. What a moment. Anybody in the band want to come down to the altar? Make your way down here. You can just put your instrument down and come if you want to come. It's the time for us just to respond to the Holy Spirit. You come. First and foremost, don't do what I did many times before I finally gave my life to Jesus. I came forward when some preacher got up all fired and preached like this. And said, I need to get saved and didn't really give my life to Jesus. Or I would come forward and they'd say, why'd you come forward for Joe? And I said, oh, I need to pray for my grandma. I need to pray for my grandma. I need to get my, right, my, my heart right with God. If you've never given your life to Jesus, when we pray this next prayer, it's a prayer of salvation for you. It's a prayer of just giving it all to Jesus. And don't be ashamed to let others know what you've done in giving your heart and life to Christ. It overcomes the mountains that are before you. You stand up boldly and publicly for Christ. It has a tendency to just blow the devil out of the pathway in front of you when you get bold for Jesus Christ. Don't settle for religion. Get into a relationship with Christ. For Christians, this is a very important point in your life. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't. This is, this is a strategic moment for you, whatever God spoke to your heart about. You stand on this moment when you face tomorrow and the days that are ahead of you. You come back to this moment when Satan hits you with that one thing and you say, no, I dealt with that Sunday morning. That's the Lord's. And it's over. Discussion's over. You keep moving forward. But I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me today. So just take the hand of the person beside you, if you don't mind. Reach out and grab a hand of someone near you. This is a prayer of, of, of an agreement, a confession. Someone around you, find somebody near you there. Just reach around and put a hand on somebody's shoulder or whatever. <laughs> so we'll get everybody just connecting to somebody. Lord, just pray that loud with me. Lord Jesus, and Father in heaven, I welcome you today to take over here in my heart, in this body, in my mind. I trust you to wash me, to cleanse me from the things that I put before you, the things that I've confessed. I claim my forgiveness today. And I trust you as the leader, as the Lord of my heart. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I am trusting in your strength because I can't do it alone. But I believe you that you are present to empower my life. So I look to you and I believe you for the in the mighty name of Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Father. With your heads bowed just for a moment. Before I ask you to go back to your seats, for those of you who are giving your life to Christ Jesus for the first time, I'm going to ask you just to take a, a seat on that front row that's to your left of you. If you're giving your life, because the Bible says that we should not only just claim it in our heart, we should confess it with our mouth. This is the first opportunity you have to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I can't think of a better place to do it than to do it around people who love God and are committed to serving Christ. So don't wander back to your seat. Don't let Satan steal this moment. Just find a seat over there. We'll make some room. Either front, in one of these two center aisles at the very front, you have a seat there. We'll come to you. One of our counselors will. One of our ushers, elders will. One of our deacons will. And we'll share with you how you can really seal this in your heart and mind. So everybody say amen. God bless you. you. May return to your seats. Unless you're one of those folks I asked to sit on the front row, just remain for a moment. Let's get this settled. Let's resolve this today. If you have questions even, if you're not sure, find a seat there in one of the front rows. Keep playing. We're going to sing a verse of this song. Sing the last verse of this song. <laughs> Stay in an attitude of prayer, folks. Death could not hold you. Fail to be
What was that name again? I, I didn't hear that. What was it? Take that, devil. Amen. Somebody give the Lord a word for your hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated this morning. I cannot tell you how excited I am in my soul and spirit for what the Lord has been doing over the weeks recently in our church and how the Spirit has been moving and working. It's been so fun to watch and so awesome to see how he works in our lives and in our hearts. So uh, I just think I'm excited for the future, what the Lord's given us. And I'll, I really feel this is the time for us to be what God's called us to be because I do believe the hour's late and that, that day it's, it's coming sooner than what most of us realize when the Lord returns. And although it will be a joyous moment for all of us who know Jesus, it's not going to be a happy time for the world we live in. Seven years of hell on earth are going to break loose. Judgment and tribulation and wrath are going to fall. And people may laugh at that and mock that, but that's the facts of the Word of God. That's the truth. And we just we need to be doing everything we can. You say, Brother Joe, if you believe that tragedy's coming, you believe it's too late for revival? No. We can have revival. We see God do great things. I don't want to be those who scatter. That Jesus talked about, if you're not for me, if you're not gathering, you're scattering. I want to be a gatherer. Let's all be gatherers. Let's commit ourselves to being gatherers. You know, fill in the lifeboats before we haul out of here. Amen. <laughs> fill the lifeboats. Let God do what he desires to do in our heart and life. Praise the Lord. If you love Jesus, say it a little bit louder. Amen. Amen. Brother Gary's got some closing information. Then we'll have some decisions we'll present to you after that. Amen. Actually, I think we, do we have a video that we'll Okay, while they're de getting that, uh, I do have Miss <laughs> Sorry I can't be downstairs this morning for our big camp announcement, but I would really like to encourage you to get your children signed up for camp. You see, we're, we're seeing more and more youth and young adults leave the church because they're not ready to give a defense for what they believe. So this year at camp, our children are going to discover how they can use the truth from the Bible and the world all around them to give a reason for what they believe, as it says in 1 Peter 3.15. That way, when they're asked, they will be able to prove it. They'll be able to give a defense for what they believe. So make sure you grab a brochure on your way out. Take advantage of that early bird special. Guys, I can't tell you how important it is to sign your children up and get them to camp. Guys, thank you, and God bless. the church that is just incredible. I just, my heart is just rejoicing and I'm just praising the Lord. Ladies, I want to talk to you for a couple minutes, but men, you can listen in. We have a ministry, it's the mentoring program, that encourages the ladies exactly the things that Brother Joe is talking about here. We can learn to know the word more, walk greater and hit in the word and walk with the Lord and it's a ministry that helps you do that 
So next, a week from tomorrow night, the 23rd of April, Monday night, at my house, I have a coffee starting. It's an orientation that explains absolutely everything that we do and that we're involved in. I would love to invite you, whether you've been in it or not before, I'd love to invite you to come and listen and hear what's said and be a part of it. Have an opportunity to grow. Have an opportunity to have a lady come alongside of you. Whether you're the mentor or the mentee, it doesn't matter. Come alongside and help you walk with the Lord. We not only have mentors and mentees, but we have prayer warriors too throughout the whole, the whole time. So come next Monday night and listen to what's said and what's shared and be a part of it. I want to thank you. Amen. Well, who's glad they came to church today? Powerful message, powerful message. We have Journey 101 today. That's uh, today at 4 p.m. here at the church. If you haven't signed up yet, that's okay. Just come up, just plan to come here at 4 o'clock. It's, it's our introductory class. It will explain a little bit more about our church, the history of our church, and uh, talk to you about joining our church. Next slide is our Financial Peace University graduates. We actually started this in February as a round of applause. We had nine families show up, or register, nine families, and in nine weeks, uh, the graduates, we were able to pay off $13,000 in debt and save over $20,000. That's in nine weeks. So this class is life-changing. If you're interested, we are going to have another Financial Peace University class uh, in the coming months. Uh, and so if you're interested in it, please do see me or call the church about that for more information. Next, a lift luncheon. That's going to be 10 minutes after we dismiss. It's going to be in the fellowship hall. So if you're a lift leader, an associate, please plan on staying afterwards. Uh, also, food pantry. Don't forget to stop by the kitchen for bread and desserts. Our men's ministry on April 22nd from 2 to 4 is going to have an archery day. The cost is $45 if you don't have any equipment, $10 if you have the equipment for the range fee. Please see Robert Pritchard for more information. Uh, two more announcements. Uh, just uh, I want to make a personal announcement. Happy birthday, Alyssa. Today's her 19th birthday, so happy birthday to her. Finally, we do have... Uh, don't forget your tithes and offerings. We don't pass the plate around here. We have offer receptacles in the back. Uh, we are debt free. It's because of you as, as members that, that provide that tithe to our church. And then finally, if I could have Linda and Steve come up to the front. Linda and Steve, if you want to come up. Linda has made a recommitment today. And Steve has prayed to receive Christ today. So praise the Lord. I would. Amen. As you are dismissed, I would ask that you come up. Elias? We'll get him next time. Absolutely. So as you're dismissed, please do come up and congratulate them on their decisions. You are dismissed. Thank you.